name is Deb Johnson. Thank you for joining me today on Our Time to Quilt. I would like to first dedicate this show to a dear friend named Michelle, who had to end up moving back to Rhode Island. I don't blame her. She went back to be with her wonderful grandbabies. I would have a hard time being away from mine also. But I miss sewing with her every week. This is my chance to try a way to find new sewing friends and to enjoy my love of teaching. So I hope that you'll find something you enjoy and please pull up your sewing machine, bring out your project and feel free to sew while I go through today's show. Today I'm thinking of having a lesson which will be landscape starting beginning landscape quilting. Then I'll show you a project I'm working on and I would love for you, to, for you to let me know what project you're working on too. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have a product review or two and then a saying of the day, a little something that might inspire you. Then I'll let you know what my next show is going to be and that's going to be exciting because I would like to give you a tour of my sewing space and give you a little talk about creating a sewing space on a budget. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. I'm a self-taught seamstress and took my first quilt lesson probably around 1988 in Southern Maryland. A very nice lady named Kathy Smith. And it's funny, I spent most of the first lesson copying all of her templates because back then we didn't have rotary cutters and strip piecing. So everything you had to take and draw around with a pencil mind you draw around a piece of cardboard and then sew every little piece together but you had to do it one layer at a time because you had to hand cut them out with scissors and little did I know that the revolution was coming and that seam rippers were on their way I found I was very busy I had three children of course I was raising and I was working at historic St. Mary City as their costumer and if you can only imagine keeping 26 living history people in clothing, it, I had to learn to sew fast and furious. And so it's not really conducive to quilting, in which you have to be a little more precise and careful. But also, I wasn't real fond of pastels. And sorry to say this, I didn't really like Sunbonnet Sue. So I tended to put, I put my quilting down for about 10 years. And then I remember, I remember clear as day, seeing an article, seeing photographs of this amazing quilter with these bold, bright colors, beautiful use of light and shimmer. And someone just very different from what was happening during that time. And if any of you know me, you know that it's my hero, Jenny Byer. And she really brought me back to quilting. In fact, I'll just show you if you're not familiar with Jenny Byer. And she has a studio shop in Great Falls, Virginia. And it's, it's a, a real enjoyable trip to, to go to her shop. Well, almost two weeks ago, she had, or maybe it was two weeks ago, she had a fabric sale. And what a fabric sale. And I can't resist Jenny Byer fabric. So I'm going to just show you some of the fabrics I got. And how lucky was I? These fabrics were on sale from between $4.50 maybe a yard to $8 or $8.50 a yard. So I made out. So in some of these colors, I mean, I'm, an, I'm mostly an art quilter. So these are my paints. And oh, I'm so excited. But aren't they beautiful? So, and I didn't even break the budget. How about that? But anyway, oh, these are my colors. I love jewel tones. You'll tend to see that if you stick around for any length of time. I love rich colors. And this is some kind of, um, it's, it's from one of her lines. It's like an Australian print. I have used this so many times. I bought two yards of this. And then lastly, pure eye candy. I mean, it's deep blue, purple, pink, fuchsia. Oh, just beautiful. If you don't, if you're not familiar with Jenny Byer, she became known early on for her extensive use 
of border prints. So I have plenty of her border prints. And they are very useful. They're very useful. And they're not only useful for borders, but in today's kaleidoscope quilts, they're just wonderful. So, anyway, so I became familiar with Jenny Byer, and I've been to her shop a few times, went to her very last seminar, actually helped her hold her amazing windows quilt, which, oh, that was amazing. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I started picking back up quilting. And I ended up joining a guild in Southern Maryland called Quilters by the Bay. And then about, I guess, 14, 15 years ago, I was lucky enough to be able to move to North Carolina. And I love it here in the foothills of North Carolina. This state is so beautiful. And the city I live in is just charming. So I'm very, very, very happy and very lucky. And, he, well, and after coming here, I started a little quilt group called Clemens Quilters. And I ran that group for nine years. And it was a wonderful experience. Met the most wonderful ladies. But last summer, I just kind of hit a wall. Ran out of ideas. And I thought, I think I need a new path, a new direction. So this video is part of that new direction. Now I'm enjoying traveling and giving trunk shows and lectures and workshops. In fact, next week I'm going to be heading to Durham and uh, to the Orange, um, Orange County Quilters and do a trunk show there. And I can't wait. I love meeting people, meeting you quilters. I love teaching. So it's just quite a passion. And at my age, it's all about having fun, which I do. The other night, I was lucky enough to go to a local quilt guild as a guest and they, they're very generous that way. And to see Bonnie Hunter in person, my first time. And she lives in this general area, but she stays so busy that sometimes us locals, we don't get to see her much. But that was a joy. There are some of the nicest quilting, people in quilting nowadays. Years and years ago, when HGTV was young, and they had websites and groups. I got to meet Alex Anderson, lovely lady, has taught me so much. And I actually got to meet her in person once or twice. And she's just as lovely in person as she is on the screen when you see her. There are people like Eleanor Burns. There are um, People like Angela Walters, for you young gals, she is delightful, cute as a button. And uh, I love watching her on her Midnight Quilt Show. Really neat gal. Then there's Leah Day, who ha I happened to meet in person a couple years ago at a retreat I went to. And very talented young lady. And I'm excited as I watch her uh, grow and develop and, and teach so many people to relax and enjoy quilting. So it's just a wonderful world out there of people. YouTube is a wonderful venue to learn just about anything from baking to car repair to sewing to knitting. It's wonderful. So I'm glad I'm here and I hope that you'll come back and join me too. The first thing we're going to do today is look at what have I been working on. And I'm just about done with it. And I'll, let me grab it and I'll show you. A couple weeks ago, I went to the Myrtle Beach Quilt Party, a wonderfully fun event held every year in January, very close to Myrtle Beach. I've been going seven years, maybe eight years, and but it's been going on for, I think, 28 or 29 years. It's a lot of fun. And I was very lucky to sign up and get a class with Miss Judy Lilly. And she lives out there on the coast, and she is a watercolor painter, which I have the highest respect for. Very, very talented. And now she also paints with fabrics. So she taught a landscaping class called Beyond Push, not Beyond, Pushing Landscape Boundaries. So I took this and used this pattern. I thought I have a lot to learn with perspective and shadowing. And she's a wonderful teacher. I must say, if there's anything you like on this quilt, give Miss Lily the credit. Anything you don't like, it's all my fault. 
<laughs> so she's an excellent teacher. This is the second class I've taken from her. I'm going to bring it in a little closer and let you see some of the thread painting that I have done. That's always a lot of fun. I wanted to give some sunlight to this tree, some definition to the plantings in the front. The only pre-printed fabric that I used was right down in front, that stone wall. Otherwise, I like doing what she labels as collage applique. And for me, using all pre-printed fabric would be a little like doing a paint by number. It kind of takes away the challenge and the fun. But now if you want to, you it's your quilt. You do exactly you do the quilt exactly like you like it. Um, a couple things I wanted to tell you about this is that I added things to her pattern. And when I quilted this, I did the I, I, I did the landscape glued and fused things in place. Then I did the thread painting to kind of highlight and give definition. And I even used some ink pencils. They look like regular colored pencils, but when you touch them with water or a gel medium, they bloom with color. So I was able to put a lot of definition in. Then when I did the quilting, I, like for this tree, I wish you could see but I, I used two layers of batting behind this tree. I wanted to give it a little 3D effect. I put extra batting behind the trunk here. And then I put an extra layer of batting behind the house. And that gives it a little, comes towards you a little bit more. I also did put extra batting behind the wall and the flowers up front so that you really got the effect that they were right up front. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And I love to be able to feel the, all the different textures. I enjoy people touching my quilts and enjoying them. I decided to put a frame system on it. This it looks very much like a linen, like you would have, what is it? Now I just lost the term, but a matted. Like it's a print that's matted. And then this is going to be, this is my frame. And so I wanted to finish it differently than putting a binding on because I do want it to look a little more like a frame. So what I did, let me see if I can show you, is I came in the seam allowance here and trimmed the batting back halfway. Then I tuck these edges in and then I'm doing a little invisible slip stitch. And this side is already done. So it gives you a chance to see that it just gives it a nice clean finish. Okay, so now having said this, and I've done a couple of landscape quilts, and, and you can take drawing classes to help if you are a little bit shy about it. Um, also, practice. Like anything else, practice, practice, practice. But I thought I'd give you just a, a few little basics so that maybe you could try something like this on your own. All right. So here we are. Let me turn my camera around. Pardon me. And I'll face it down because I want you to be able to see what we're doing here. All right. All right. Whoops. Pardon me. I'm, I'm trying to get used to dealing with this camera. And I will. Let me move this out of the way, guys. All right. Here we go. All right. Here you start with a piece of muslin. Make sure you start with a piece that's wider and taller than what you want your final dimension of the quilt to be. I'm having a hard problem getting that focused correctly. Let's hope it'll... It's a little confused. The lens is a little confused as to where to focus. Alright, so you start with a piece of muslin. You've got the muslin. Longer, wider, then wider, taller, whatever words you want to use. And then you take and you get fusible interfacing and you iron it to the back. That will give your muslin some stability 
for all of the work you're going to be adding a lot of layers you're going to be doing thread painting quilting and you don't want it to pull and distort It'll, it muslin itself is not thick enough to protect it so you've got the back you've got a fusible interfacing iron very firmly on the back of this then and pretend you don't see the screen fabric <laughs> I'll explain more on that in a minute all right Miss Lily taught me something very special and she taught me to use golden threads paper I before I took a class of hers a couple years ago I'd never heard of it and see it's very translucent but it's right strong and it's a wonderful wonderful quilting paper because you can trace through it um, you can stitch through it so it's very versatile and this roll is 18 by 20 yards so it's the only roll that I will need for the rest of my life and very helpful now this is what I have on top and if you'll notice I've pinned it to the muslin then I take usually I take an ink pen pencils sometimes can pierce the surface and I need to be able to see you know it gets harder and harder to see as we um yeah mature and uh, so but anyway you draw what you think you're going to want on this then when you have and you label it like I'm gonna have a mountain here love mountains mountains make any scene look better love mountains I'm gonna have two layers of mountains on this sky then I'm gonna have a level of trees run right here back on the horizon then I'm going to try to have some kind of water feature, like a creek or pond, I'm not sure. Then, then I'm going to have a grassy field, pasture, whatever you want to call it. Maybe I'll put a fence in. I'm not sure. I'm just going to kind of play and see how it goes. It's actually a lot of fun. It's kind of like paper dolls cutting out and deciding what you... It's yours to play with, however you want. Then I decided I wanted a tree here. Now, once I thought I had it, and I looked it over, and I kind of worked it out, make sure you hold it up, look at it from a distance. Now, Miss Lily has some patterns, if you look her up on the internet. And in hers, she will have, on copy paper, sometimes very large, she'll have an overall pattern. And that way, you then take your piece of golden threads, lay it on top of her pattern, and trace over it. And that way, you can use that tracing to know what size to cut your pieces, like how deep to cut your mountain pieces, how long, all of that. And in fact, from the class, this is my golden threads paper that I use to trace over her pattern. So her patterns are very reasonable, and to already include the... the, the um, basic pattern is pretty nice now I added things I added like the swing and the tree and I changed I put a porch on the house and and then added my wall you saw that was right here and Miss Lily encourages that she says you know make it your own which is wonderful I wanted to tell you too she does something also which is she numbers each piece okay and that way you know in what order and then she'll label them. If it's like the tree, she'll put an F on it for fusible. So remind you that to fuse this fabric before you cut it out. Sometimes she'll have a, um, a U, which means under, or an arrow, which means, I'm sorry, not a U, but an arrow, which means tuck it under. But you could use a U for tuck it under. And what that means, and the reason that's important, is this mountain is going to be tucked under this next mountain. So you have to know, don't just cut this. You've got to cut it wide enough for this mountain to lay on top. It just makes it easy to make sure you have no gaps in your, in your landscape. All right, so we've talked about how to draw this. And, you know, you can look at photographs. You can take drawing classes. Um, it, it, one thing you have to decide when you start to do a landscape quilt, that one thing you have to take, uh, you have to think about. I'm going to pull this a little closer. Pardon me just a second. I want you to really be able to see it. All right. All right. Now, one, one thing, uh, okay, one thing I want you to be able to see 
is you have to decide when you do a landscape quilt where to put your horizon. Usually they recommend that you don't put it right in the middle. That's just a little bit too easy. Now there might be something reasons you have to put it in the middle. Let's say you're interested in getting a reflection off the lake of the trees behind in the sky. So then you need room. But what we decided, what I decided for this one, is just make the sky about a third of the way down. So my horizon line is going to be here. Just gives it a little more interest instead of being cookie cutter, putting it right in half. You could also, if you wanted your sky to be the predominant part of your landscape quilt, you could also then put, bring your horizon down near the bottom. And, you know, then your sky would have to be very interesting, but that might be something you like. All right, so the reason I said don't look at this green fabric is because in landscape quilts, you start at the top and you work down. And if you were to look off into the distance, you would notice the sky and the horizon, then trees in front of that, and then lawn in front of those, and then a house or something maybe in front of that, or wall, and you would see that everything, the furthest thing away is that sky or the horizon, and everything is put on top of that, so you want to duplicate that with your fabrics. So here I've got the sky for the one-third, okay? And I got excited thinking about grass. Miss Lily taught us that, I was taught in that class, that things further away are lighter colored, more faded. As they come towards you, they become darker, more vibrant, brighter. And so I got excited thinking that I've got this graduation fabric. Some people call them ombre fabrics. And I got excited about that. So I pulled out a piece of it. And as you can see, I hope you can tell, that this green is lighter than this green. So I automatically, the fabric's doing the work for me. So it starts from lighter green, comes down here to a darker green. I like that. So I got a little excited and put it on too soon. So just kind of pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> so the next thing then we're gonna do, we've got our sky. The next thing is the first mountain. Now, the first mountain should mountain should be your most faded mountain or your light, lightest color. So I lay that there. Now, the nice thing about pinning this paper and with it being your pattern is then when you place your mountain, you can bring paper down and check and see how your lines are running. And let me see if I can show you. If you can see through here, see how you can tell where your mountain should be through the paper, you can see the fabric. So that's really pretty awesome, I like that. So it saves a lot of time and it's kind of important if you think about it because you wanna keep your perspective. When when you have a landscape laying on a table like this, you're seeing it at a very odd angle. It's not the angle that you'll ever see it again because you'll have it hanging on a wall in some form. So it's really good to have this pattern to just remind you of what you already wanted. Now, I want another mountain. Love mountains, take up good amount of space, look interesting. So I made a darker turquoise mountain because blue is my favorite color. And also, this is my landscape, this is my world, this is my quilt, and I can do whatever I want. Remember that. It's, it's supposed to be fun. If it's not fun, why are we going to spend time and money to do it? So, it's all about having fun. Now I've got the two mountain ranges in, looking pretty good. Alright, so, at this point, I'm going to pull this back up just because I can. And in fact, I better put this mountain over top of it. All right, yep, mountain still looks good. All right, so nice and easy just to check that. All right, now these were put on freezer paper. The freezer paper you just get at your grocery store. 
it's got a paper side and then a shiny side. And it, the nicest thing, some people say, oh, it's the wax on it. Well, I don't really think it's wax. I think it's a form of plastic that I read. And you can see it's real, sh can you see that shine? Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, um, if you put the shiny side to the back of the fabric, and then you press it with an iron, I'm not sure how warm my iron is, but you press it with an iron and it will stick and then when you're ready to pull it off you just pull it off and it's very easy man I'm not my irons not heated up yet so let me give it a moment but anyway let's say you have a night you you put a big piece on this and then it gives you let's say then you cut but or it, I, I would have cut this edge ahead of time from the freezer paper, ironed the fabric on it, left a half an inch over, and then you can take and press this back against the freezer paper. You can even put little touches of glue to hold it until you pull the freezer paper out, which I've already done. I, in fact, this probably came, maybe it came, no, it came from that mountain. But um, now, when you take off the freezer paper, don't throw it away yet because you can get about five or six uses out of this. So let me see if my iron is hot now. Put the shiny side to the wrong side of the fabric, just showing you how easy it is to put on the fabric. There we go. All right. See? And then when you, and, and the nice thing about having freezer paper is it gives you a nice firm surface to draw on. So if you wanted to, you could draw out the shapes that you wanted the lawn or the mountain or whatever to be. But mainly it's because you want that sharp edge of folding over that fabric. And the freezer paper will give you, a, look, see if you just, it's got a, a, some weight to it. So you could take and press this really well. And then look at that. It holds the line. And it gives a nice sharp, look at that sharp line. All right. But we don't need this now, so I'm just going to show you how easy it is to take off. Could not be easy. It leaves no sticky residue on the fabric that you can discern. Now, I noticed that the fabric's not quite as shiny because I think it takes a little layer of that off at a time. But you can, like I say, you can use this. What I would do is if I wanted to make a small plant, I would press this on the back maybe. But um, I don't throw them away. I save them. So, now what I'm going to do is take this and put it here. Now, some it's, it's hard for me to know how much I like this. And I see I normally don't use pre-printed fabric. And this kind of is a pre-print, but it's random enough. I just wanted to look of texture in the front. And I'm worried, though, because fields don't just start and stop from this to bam, that. But, remember when I said I'm going to do some kind of water. And who knows if this will be the fabric that I end up using. But I'm thinking that maybe this water would give me a good reason to have this fabric in front. So I'm going to be playing with this over the next week so that when we meet again next week, you'll see what solution I came up with. All right, so these, let me check just one more time. These are looking really good. They fall into line with the shapes that I wanted. The grass is up just about high enough that um, my water will be just right above it, I do believe. All right, so what I like to do what you're going to eventually be doing is using invisible thread. They have smoky colored and they have an just regular invisible. For the dark color, I might use the smoky invisible thread and do a zigzag right at the top here to attach it. And then maybe the clear monofilament or invisible thread and do a zigzag and stitch this along this mountain. Okay? But I'm not ready to do that yet. You can do it if you want to. Go right ahead. But I like to play. I like to have fun. So what I'm going to do is peel these back. Put a few drops of glue. Peel this back. A few drops of glue. Because this will hold it in place until I'm ready to do the sewing. And then I can do 
all that stitching at once. So I don't have to go back and forth constantly. So, I, you saw I just did a few little quick drops of glue. Now I'm going to come down here and do the same thing here. Just a few drops of glue. Notice I don't use much because glue is very tough to sew through. It becomes like a plastic or a polymer that, whew, it's really tough. Now, I'm just taking and running my iron over because the heat from the iron will hurry up and dry that glue and get you an adhesion a little bit faster. All right, I've got my mountain, my sky, my two types of grass. So what I've got next, I wanted that tree line along the horizon. Something to kind of break up between mountains and a field. And because we're supposed to use the lighter color for further away, I use this fabric with lots of yellows. It's lighter than the fabric in the foreground. And these are supposed to represent a tree line that runs along here. And it kind of anchors the mountains so they're not out there floating around. And um, But what I did is I did use some fusible. But then I just I fused these two rows of trees together so it was much easier to put down. And that way I could have them fall just the way I wanted. So I'm going to bring the fabric back down. Check my line of trees. I need to raise them up. So I'm just going to push them up a little. And right good. Like it, like it, like it. Okay. So... Bring this side up just a touch. All right, so then what I, I'm going to do now, and you could use fusible on this. I just find this a little faster and easier. All right, and I changed my mind a lot, and this is so much easier to take up than fusible. All right, so that's all it takes. That's easy, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, like I said, it's like playing with uh, paper dolls cutting things out, gluing them back. It's like craft time when you were back at... Don't you remember? I loved craft time, art time when I was back in elementary school. Just loved it. Alright. I want to make sure this mountain doesn't show through. Let's say if that shows through but you don't want to bring your tree line down, then just go back behind and... In fact, I'm going to do that right now. Go back behind and then trim off. In fact, um, I was taught that it's probably good to, to lift this up and cut back to just a quarter of an inch or an inch or so from the top of the tree line so you don't have so many layers. But I love doing thread painting so the layers to me just gives it a little more stability. So now we have that. And as you can see, follows the tree line. So, so far we're doing really good. The last thing we have to do is to add our tree. Before I do add the tree, though, I want to show you, this is some nice dark green fabric. It's wonderful for tree lines and anywhere it doesn't have to be too distinct. And I've gone ahead and ironed Wonder Under to a good size piece of this. Now, um, even with small pieces, sometimes I'll still use a little bit of glue. But this is really nice because if you've got the Wonder Under, which is a, a fusible, You've got this paper side left to it, and then you can take your pencil or pen, and you can draw whatever bush you want to cut out. Then you cut it out, peel off the paper, put it down on your fabric and iron it, and it's there. It's there. Then you can take later on and just sew around it or do the quilting over it, whatever, that you make sure it will hold in place. All right, that's where I did my... my um, thread painting is take colors and whether you want to highlight it or just have them more invisible or blend in and sew all around it. And I was going to show you that once you do that, once you have ironed the Wonder Under to the fabric and you cut things out, as you can see for the landscape with the house, I cut some of the shrubbery out of this. Well, look at the, it gives you a head start for what you might want to cut out next. I mean, this already put a few more little zigzags and you've got another interesting shrub. So I don't throw away any of this. I save it and, and look at this. This was from the tree line 
And look at that. It would give me almost another tree line or for another project. So this is get saved. Can always use that later. All right. So there, cover diffusible. Wonder under comes by the yard or in packages. And the rough side is diffusable. The smooth side is the paper. It makes it nice and stiff and easy to draw on. Here is the fusible itself. And once the iron heat hits that, then it meshes and glues it to the fabric you put it on. So that's Wonder Under. And there's all kinds of fusibles out there. And you'll find out which one is your favorite. Well, guess what? It's time for the tree. And I always get excited when it comes to adding things like this. This, to me, is the icing on the cake. Here is my tree. What, and it's got, it's got fusible on the back of it. And what I did is had a piece of this barky looking fabric. See how it has all the wood grains in it. And I had a piece about five inches, a little taller than this. And I pressed the Wonder Under on it on the wrong side, peeled off the paper, but while the paper was on I was able to cut what I wanted my roots to look like, cut the top, the shape, it just gave it a little stability. So now I come in and lay it about where I think it goes and then pull down my pattern. And I don't know if you noticed earlier, but there's a seam in this fabric because I didn't have one piece big enough, but that's okay because you won't even see this. I put the tree on it, it disappears. So that's one thing I love about landscape fabrics is they're very economical. Now, especially when it comes to like, oh, that's pretty. Especially when it comes to collage applique where you can save all those little bits and bobs that you've had hanging around and you can cut them up into little tiny pieces and put in the flower garden. All right. So now I take the iron and I press. Now press, you notice I'm pressing. I am not ironing. You don't want to do this to fusible. And you don't want to over press because you want to melt the fusible enough to stick it down but you don't want it to totally dissolve into the fabrics or else you'll be able to just peel it right back up it's like it loses its stick so all things in moderation <laughs> but I wanted to show you here are all the bits and bobs I had left from cutting this tree out and I don't throw these away either because these become branches these become limbs you see, and all I have to do is peel the paper off, press them down. Also, even some of the small ones, because if you've ever looked at a tree, you'll, especially when it's leafed out, you'll only see a little piece of a limb. So I might stick that there, and then by the time I have the leaves and all around it, it gives a touch of realism. Now, you can if you want to save this. I'm not sure if this is worth that much, but... The bottom line is, save all your pieces. You never know when you'll use them. If not for this project, then the next landscape. All right, so I think that's looking pretty good. And I think that's enough for today. This also will give you a chance to choose your fabrics, to figure out what kind of landscape you want, and maybe you can catch up with me and you can get all your things set up and we can work on this together next week. Um, one more thing I wanted to tell you is you'll notice not all of my fabrics go to completely to the edges. And that's just fine because remember I made it bigger. So I only run my good fabric to where I'm going to trim it. So don't worry about that one bit. Alright, well I'm going to put this away. And I sure hope that you'll try this because as you've seen, there's nothing really fancy that I've done. And nothing that's really hard. And I don't consider this something only an artist could do. A bunch of wavy lines. Remember, there are no straight lines in nature. So, drawing in free form, the more the better. All right, I'm going to fold this up and get this out of the way. And I think I'm going to talk first about a product review. 
All right, nice and cleaned up. Good, good, good. All right, I want to talk to you about a product review. And I love product reviews. I love tips because that way you don't have to make every mistake yourself. You can learn from other people's mistakes. Let me push this lighting back just a touch, guys. All right. The product review, I have two products I'd like to talk to you about. One is a no-brainer. This is a hmm, copy holder. So if you were typing or on your computer, this would hold whatever you were typing. But I love it for holding patterns and directions. I take it to my retreats and workshops. It's wonderful. So I highly recommend that. That's a good one. Now I have a product that didn't turn out quite the way I'd like. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this. But do you see these two pins? And I have tried on camera to, to show you, and it's really hard for you to really see what I mean. But the pin right here with the purple top, one right, right closest to my finger, is called an easy grip pin. And I got very excited when I heard about these because I have arthritis, like most of us of an age have. And I thought, ooh, anything that's easier to grab, that would be a good thing. And I like this nice big tip on it, right? The only problem, the thing is thick. It's like, I call them train track spikes, train spikes. So they're just too thick and big. And I don't like putting holes in my fabric with them. Actually, they're good if you want to stick them into a wall to hold a quilt up. They won't bend easily. But I just thought I would say these were expensive. They were like 8 or $9 for 50 And I think it was 50 of them. Might have been $100. I don't, I don't want to sell the company short. But I would say for precision, showing, shucks, precision sewing, you don't want these. And I wouldn't use them in fabric for clothing, especially knits and satins, because I think they would end up catching and snagging it. All right, now let's talk about next week's show. Next week's show, I wanted to tell you early, but I've got another project to work on with you. Next week's show, I'm going to give you a tour of my studio. And I love looking at people's studios because you get lots of ideas of things you can try at home. And I recently did a renovation of my studio, and I painted it, put in new flooring, got rid of the carpet. I, I'm sorry, but the carpet didn't work well. It was nice because it was warm on, under your feet, because I am in a walkout basement, and so the floor can, you know, it's concrete under this um, laminate. But I love the light gray laminate, and I love the color I chose for the walls, and I've done some interesting things. Well. Looks like over here, my newly put on under cabinet lighting might be starting to droop. But we'll get that stapled up before the tour next week. And I will actually see down that dark hallway. Whoop, right there, that dark hallway. I have a countertop, a, a eight or nine foot long countertop there. It is so chock a block full, three feet tall with fabric because when I start a new project I'm like this I get in those fabric boxes and I'm tossing it left and right over over my head and I get so excited to work on the project I don't want to stop and nicely fold things and put them away I want to work so I end up throwing them on that counter so I promise to have that clean but I still might show you my closets because I don't clean those very well but anyway, so, so that's, I'm looking forward to that, showing you how I created this room on a budget. I have uh, ideas in the future of doing partial shows or show or total show um, upstairs in my guest bedroom where I keep my frame. Yes, Deb has two rooms of this not very large house. It's comfortable. 
And that's, oh, isn't it wonderful? The children finally leave home and no longer do you have to quilt on the dining room table. Oh, do you remember the days you'd, you'd get everything set up, have a little time to work, and then bam, there's another meal to feed them and they spill. So you had to clean all your stuff back up. I have paid my dues. So in this house, I made sure when we looked that it would have a good size room for me to quilt in. And I am very spoiled. I, I'm very lucky. And um, But upstairs, we had we have three bedrooms upstairs. We really don't have guests. I mean, you know, the kids come home once in a while, but I have a daughter in the area. And so I thought, why do we have these guest rooms just sitting here? So I took one of them and beat mark to it. <laughs> but hey, what can I say? I, I'm not going to waste time. And so I put my um, long arm frame up in that bedroom. And so next show, or the one after, I'd like to take you up and kind of just show you some certain things. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a frame? Um, I got a really good deal on mine, and I can show you what it's like to load a quilt, and no more basting, and how easy they can be, how frustrating at first, but how easy they can be used, and how quickly you can get a quilt done. Remember, back when I started quilting, there was only one way. All backing was muslin, unbleached, and all quilting was done with your fingers. And I still can rock, neat, rock um, stitch quilt, but it takes a long time. So I no longer take any customers that want to have their quilt hand quilted. It's like, mm -mm, nope, I'm sorry, but a penny an hour is not enough. So now the next thing I'd like to show you today, I have, I'm going to show you what project I'm working on, but I'd like to show you one more thing. And I thought, hmm, what can I give them a little hint or tip about? And today it's about erasers. Now back when, like I was telling you, when I first learned to quilt, we used pencils, regular number two pencils, to trace our patterns, our templates. And templates are coming back. That kind of surprises me. I was happy to get rid of templates and all that individual tracing and cutting. The new ones are a little easier because you can use a rotary cutter, but honestly, I don't want to have to get a sandboard back out and draw around those templates. I'm sorry. But anyway, so, but we used pencil line. So here's a, I did a, oh, let me see. I'm having a hard time seeing this pencil line I drew. I, right, whoops, this way. Oh, the other way. <laughs> I can't do it backwards. But anyway. But before, and see, I use the ink tense pencils that have a fabric ink in them and stuff. So sometimes I need to erase a line. Now, I, I'm not saying I use pencils to draw my quilts anymore, but this is just a good way to represent this to you. But it could be ink tense pencil, it could be whatever. And while I'm talking about it, I just like to mention something. It's so funny, we found these friction pins and everybody went nuts over them and they're great and oh boy, look at this, I can draw a line and then I can take the little rubbery tip and with friction, it comes off. But then everyone went, oh no. When they're put in the freezer, the line comes back. Pardon me for being a little flip, but I don't often store my quilts in the freezer and I don't often stand out in sub-zero temperatures and show people quilts. So I use these, and I don't worry about it. And if a line pops back up, I hit it with a steam iron. It's gone again. But sorry, just had to add that in. Anyway, sometimes we like to have things to worry about. But, um, but I was going to tell you that I was working on a quilt. In fact, it was an applique. Um, and I was working on a quilt, and I just picked up a pencil to erase the line. Well, the pencil is red if you can see. And some pencils have blue erasers. So I'm erasing and all of a sudden I realize, oh my gosh, the red colorant that they put in the erasers left a pinkish blush on my quilt. And no matter how hard I brushed all the little bits off, there was still a pink blush. 
and I thought not smart so I wanted to tell you anytime you're at anywhere Walmart or office supply and you see these little put on the add-on eraser tips that are white grab them have a stash uh, white erasers they come in fabric erasers white but if they're white they don't have color colorants that are going to stain your quilt another good eraser for using for quilts are the good old art gum erasers that we've been using for years and they're very careful and thorough at removing uh, lines and things you don't want this is a Prismacolor art gum and it was $1.29 I used to get these for a quarter but that was 40 some years ago but anyway these make the white erasers fabric erasers or art gum are much much better at removing stains and spots and you do know if you get blood on a quilt lick your finger and rub on it because the enzymes in your spit will break down the protein in the blood so use your own spit for your own blood all right that's that boy I gave you extra tips today so what am I working on I I have a frame up a quilt on the frame upstairs and what this is what I do I have a sewing project that I'm working on on the machine I keep a project on the frame upstairs because I don't always sometimes I only like to frame quilt for two hours then I find I start making stupid mistakes or my my arms get a little tired or if I notice I start having tension problems it's from fatigue so then I also keep hand projects near my recliner at night so when Mark and I are watching TV I can keep my hands busy because I don't know about you but I like having something in my hands at all times and um, but this is what I'm working on right now this is called a binding star tool quilt I mean a binding tool star quilt that's a lot of title and I did this up on my EQ8 love EQ8 the newer one is even better than the 7 I highly recommend it and it's it's a lot more intuitive so it's easier to learn because the other one I'm sorry I don't do good with complex written directions I'm a visual person so all right so this is a binding tool this is an acrylic ruler and it's about eight inches long let me see I keep these sticky let me show you these sticky measuring tapes stuck to all my edges my ironing board edge has one this uh, every table has one of these for quick measuring love them so this ruler is eight and a half inches long and what it's made for is to show you for the binding to show you how to make this nice um, angled line so you don't end up with big lumpy bindings so I do like that but how cool and this this end is supposed to show you how far apart to leave you know the bits and but how cool that Jenny Doan in fact I forgot to mention her earlier oh I love Jenny Doan and it's on my bucket list to come to the Missouri Star town and Hamilton Missouri and see all her shops and then I'm gonna go by and see Angela Walters shops too would that be fun or what I need a week and a half yeah that's it that's it but anyway so here's the binding tool now if your binding tool is blue peel off the little protective film because <laughs> it's not supposed to be blue but anyway so what you're doing what you have I you want to see my binding tool star it's this quilt back on the wall and right now it just has the center now I this is my third binding tool star that I'm making but there's a story behind it I have three grandchildren who are all married and not one of them has their wedding quilt yet and I promise I'm gonna finish I promise I promise I promise I don't, I, I don't know why I tell you these things but anyway I'm the queen of UFOs look a shiny new quilt <laughs> and off I go but anyway um 
what I wanted to tell you is that I gave my binding tool, the first binding tool star quilt I made, gorgeous. Oh my gosh, it was scrappy, and I'm no good at scrappy. Terrified of scrappy, and it worked. And I had 20, over 20 students in my class. Most popular quilt I've ever taught. And, um, oh, and I teach at Sewingly Yours, Louisville, North Carolina. If you've ever wanted a shop that's like a family, that's like a second home, that's the shop for you. So, um, I, um, when I saw this, I came home and made it and had it totally made and quilted and bound in two weeks, which is rare for Deb. But anyway, so much fun. And if you want to, you can go to Missouri Star Quilt YouTubes and they have the Binding Tool Star Quilt on there. So I highly recommend it. If you want to one day for us to make it together, let me know. Send me, put comments down below. Send me an email. And uh, I would love to do it again. It's a lot of fun. But I gave my binding. I was feeling such guilt to my oldest child who has been married quite a few years. And so I gave her my binding tool star quilt and she loves it. But the problem is, since I love to do trunk shows and lectures, I'm always having to say, hey, do you mind yanking that off the wall again so I can take it to the trunk show? I decided maybe it's time to make another one. And uh, you're probably thinking, well, you said you had three. Well, the second one, I'm appliquing a border on it. And, you know, I do hand applique needle turn. It takes a while. So it will be done, but it takes a while. So this one I'm making, I'm going to put a, a piano key border on it. And so... Let, let me tell you a little bit more about it. That quilt takes one jelly roll of fabric. And I love the jelly roll. Two and a half inch strips. And guess what this measures? Two and a half inches. And so what you do, you have to do cut a piece. In fact, you can see this shape. See with this angled edge. You can see this shape in the quilt. It's just this shape, squares, and background. So very simple. So anyway, and but you have to have you have to have it cut one way and then the reverse. So if you pull the fabric off, if you pull the fabric off the jelly roll, and you'll see it's folded. Okay, right sides together or wrong sides. And then you lay your binding tool template on here with the rotary cutter. There you go. And this one still had the points on it. But it's just that simple to make. And then what I'm going to do is put an inner border. Okay, let me lean back again. If you'll notice the squares that are in that program, I made with this fabric. The squares that are in that pattern, I made with this fabric. It's a wonderful batik with purples and lime green and, and pink and blue. Lovely. So I'm going to use this two and a half, cut two and a half inch strips. I'm going to use this to do the inner border. I just butt jointed my pieces and I cut eight because I thought, okay, it's about 65 at least around. So I'll say two length, two widths of fabrics for each side, and then that way I know I have plenty. Now, if I didn't have that much fabric, then I would be more careful. But I've joined all these together. I just need to press them. Put them over here to get pressed. And then what you do is you take a tape measure and you measure the center of the quilt horizontally and vertically. The reason you measure the center is that's where you get the more accurate measurement. Now some people would say, why don't you just grab this and put it along the edge and just sew and when you get to the bottom cut it and then start the next side. Well, have you ever seen quilts with wavy edges? I'm like, Whew, wavy edges. Well, that's because over the length of the run, the fabric can do many different things. But in the center, you get the truest, best measurement. And so you cut it to that measurement and you make the quilt behave. And you pin it top and bottom and middle. 
and you ease it all the rest in. That way you know you're going to get a square quilt without the waves. All right, then for my outer border, I'm going to make piano keys. And what you find with, after you're, you've cut the things you need for your jelly roll, you have a lot of, lots of bits and bobs. So I'm going to take all these bits and bobs and add them together. And I'm going to make a jelly roll edge to go around it. Now next week when I see you again, I'm going to show you a special corner detail that I like. It's always bothered me when you have piano key border, but the sides they are going this way, the tops are going this way. Well, what do you do with that corner? So what I've done is done a paper piece pattern that acts like sun rays that fans the piano keys out so it kind of makes a smoother transition. So I'll show you that next time. But anyway, I'm going to leave you today. Please, if you've liked this video, please hit like down below in the directions. Le feel free to leave me comments, things you'd like to see, things you'd like me to do. I plan to have another video, hopefully, cross your fingers, next Monday. And um, so let me know what you think. Please send emails, send pictures of what you're working on. Tell me what you're working on. I'd love to see it. If you don't mind, I'll even show it on camera next week. And, um, and at some point, you may, uh, we may go live with these. So let me know what you think. Anyway, I've got a lot of piano keys to make. And you know they're called piano keys because you you sew them long sides together. When they lay out, they look like a piano keyboard. So I'm going to leave you now. Then I hope you get a chance to keep working on what, you, what project you brought out. And we'll see you next week. All right.